Praise the Lord. And I'm still light on my feet, huh, my brother? <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless everyone. You may be seated. We spoke uh, last time <clears throat> on uh, James. We, co- we covered the book of James. We're, we're, we're speaking on the seven books before the book of Revelation and and uh, some of, one of the things that I mentioned in the first Bible study is how they, they correlate with the, pretty much with the tribulation period. There's certain, there's certain things that the Lord placed in order. And uh, they're just, it's just the fingerprint of God pointing out that that's, that's his book. The order is perfect in the whole scriptures. Because uh, many people say, well, why do the books in a certain order? Nobody can explain why, but they are. And it's just that God put them in that order. Now, <clears throat> on the book of First Peter, where these are going to be what we would correlate, and that's almost like the, uh, as he was, uh, the book of James, it's going to be First and Second Peter, then it's going to be First, Second, and Third John, and it's going to be Jude. And so we're going to be, uh, these two books, Peter and John, are also sort of lengthy, uh, as far as, I mean, you could, you could p- teach on a whole year probably on, on, uh, on any of these books, you know, if you could put certain topics, what brings to mind, uh, there's a, a minister that uh, I think spoke on, I don't know how many years, <laughs> on Matthew, and the whole congregation had like a, a smile every time, oh, we're going we're gonna to teach on <laughs> Matthew today. <laughs> Because that's all he only taught. So I, I, I think I saw him about a year later, something like that, and they were still speaking on Matthew. So it's a, that proves my point. It's possible. So in the book of First and Second Peter, okay, where do we begin? Let me say this, first of all, about Peter. The reason I feel this is such an important book in the canon is because Peter is the one that is given the, the uh, authority. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he tells us, and, to, and uh, I, I give the keys of the kingdom to, uh, give them to Peter. Whatsoever he binds on, on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever he loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So that means whatever Peter uttered here on this earth when it came to doctrine, it would be, it would be bound in heaven. In other words, heaven would be in agreement with whatever he said. Can you say amen? There's no other apostle that was given this, that was given this, uh, this authority. Even though they all had apostolic authority, Peter was the one chosen to open the doors to the kingdom of the church. And after that, they're all equal and all that, but he is special in that sense that he institutes, he institutes uh, in the book of Acts, he brings in the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles and he baptizes them all the same. So we know that all, all of them, whether Jew or Gentile, have to be baptized. And they have to be baptized in Jesus' name. So he bounded here on earth. It's bound in heaven. Can you say amen? So the devil ever comes against you. And, you know, and, and uh, they come knocking on your door. And you see their bikes through the window. Or, and you realize that you know, they bring a different doctrine. And you, you can debate them. You can do whatever you'd like to, but know this, that it's according to the way the Lord laid it out. There's no other gospel. Even if an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel, the Bible said, let it be accursed. So he's the main authority in laying down this foundation. So <clears throat> that's just quite a bit because Jesus was telling them, I'm going to be leaving, but this is the man you listen to when I'm gone. And so he, he wrote... And then later on, Paul comes around. So it's very important when he writes his two epistles. In fact, they brought it more to life in my life as far as looking at it again. And I looked at it in a, in a refreshing manner saying, okay, I need to look at him like these things that he's put in there must be very important for him to bring them down to our day. So First Peter 1 and 1, it says this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, this is this out of this statement. I'm going to take this this portion here. To the strangers 
scattered throughout, all right? So what he is saying here is he's saying to those that are, in the Greek is to those, the strangers is to those that are from another land that are in this land right now that were scattered throughout. So he's saying we are like pilgrims and strangers here on this earth. He's telling the Christians at that time. In other words, once the Lord called you out, you are not part of the world system. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? You're not part of the world system. You have to recognize that by faith. If you don't recognize it, then it's either through ignorance or a rebellious nature or whatever it might be. But this is what he tells. He tells us you must see yourself as pilgrims and strangers in this land because that's what we are. So he lays this from the very beginning. He says this, that we are chosen. He says the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And then he says through the sanctification of the spirit by the receiving of the Holy Ghost unto obedience because we were obedient and the sprinkling of blood which happened through water baptism, uh, the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. So we have the potential and the blessing to have peace multiplied upon us because we have done everything that the apostle tells us to do. And he, he's addressing not just anybody, he's addressing people that have already been baptized. So it's not a common letter to anybody. It is a, it is a letter that is common only to Christian uh, or the saints. I shouldn't say Christianity. To the saints of God. This is what it's addressed to. To the strangers that have been that have come in the proper way. Then it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. What does that mean? The main portion here is he has begotten us. We have been born again. We have been adopted. There's no greater power than adoption. When we are adopted, we are as good as natural, but even greater because we are chosen. This is the way the Caesars always used to do it in those days. Their, their children were hardly ever a Caesar after them. They always saw somebody that they liked, that they had qualities, and then they would choose them, and they would give them the title of Augustus or whatever it was, and, and they would become Caesars. So this is what the Lord is telling us, that we have been begotten or we have been born again. We have been birthed by the Father. We have a Father through Jesus. Now, this is very important to recognize because that's where our heavenly, God is our Father through Jesus. That's why you're baptized into Jesus through Jesus, and you have a Father. His name is, we call him, we call him our Father, but that's God, our Father. You get that? So this is what Peter's telling us. And here, apparently, when he's written this, he used to be a fisherman, but he's, he's writing with great knowledge, and he's, great, he's, reading with, he's giving us a teaching with great depth. And so we know that he, he thoroughly understood once he received uh, the Holy Ghost and the day of, on the day of Pentecost, he becomes a transformed man. He's not thinking about fishing anymore. He's thinking about writing things in such depth and clarity that you have to really sit down. And, and I have missed a lot of it till recently until I actually sit down and take a look at this and to realize what he's telling us. He tells us this in verse uh, 4. To an inheritance incorruptible. Uh, it says undefiled, that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. So, Notice this, to an inheritance, all right, to an inheritance. I uh, don't think I'm going to leave a very big inheritance, okay? So, <laughs> I, and, and this is important. We leave, some people have a lot, of, but they leave an inheritance. An inheritance is after someone dies. My dad passed, and uh, he, left, uh, he left a smaller inheritance. So there's some people, he's smart. He spent it while he, he spent it while he could. God bless him, amen. How much did he leave, someone said? All of it. But the problem is, the, the situation is, an inheritance is such, when somebody dies, that's what they leave, correct? And then somebody, the offspring, get it. Now, 
Someone had to die for us to get an inheritance. Jesus died for us to give us an inheritance. But surprise, he rose again to give it to us personally. Amen. So that we might receive it. So all things were done by himself and for himself. So that's important that when you talk about inheritance, it should bring to remembrance, wait a minute, somebody had to die. Well, he did. He gave his life for us. So this inheritance is reserved in heaven for you. So a lot of people try to say, well, our inheritance is here right now. No, we already are qualified or we're qualifying for our inheritance. But our, inter- our inheritance is reserved in heaven for us and for you. So this is what the Bible is teaching us, that this is why we spend our time here as pilgrims and strangers, because we have a better place ahead. Can we all say praise the Lord to that? You, we have, I have a better place ahead. Okay, now the Bible says this, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed. Something's going to happen in this last day. It says, who are kept by the power of God. We're kept by the power of God through faith. We keep believing God every day we wake up. We keep believing again. We read the Bible. If 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 our battery goes down, we keep believing. We trust God. We come to church. We read. You must read. You must feed yourself. You must get get sort of uh, desperate about wanting to make heaven your home. Amen. Knowing that the alternative is horrific, all right? But we, all we do is keep ahead, though, that the Lord saved us from a future punishment through the blood. Therefore, we think on that and we come better through him. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. This is ready to be revealed in the last time, or this is in the last days. Whom having not seen, notice this, you love. In whom though you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So, even, even those that the Lord has appeared to, they never hardly ever seen his face, there's always a glory. Can you say amen? So, having not seen, you love, in whom though you see him not, yet believing, you re- uh, this is one of my favorite verses to me. Whom having not seen, I'm amazed that I can love someone that I've not even seen. That's a miracle. It's because of his effect in my life, I, I know in whom I have believed, having not seen him. And blessed is he who has not seen yet hath believed. So it feeds upon itself. So you work out your salvation with fear and trembling through the, through the mind, through the process. This is very important, your mind. This is, how, this is why you have to take time out of your devices sometimes because your mind is a terrible thing to waste, as they say. And the waste is a terrible thing to mind. So keep your mind up here in Jesus. Now, who having not seen, no, notice this. It says this. You rejoice with joy and speak of full of glory, and then it makes a statement. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So that's the point of it all, that we might be saved. There's no other purpose once you, want, and, and if you've been raised in the church, your purpose must be all right. Yeah, I have to get, I have to be saved. I'm given the biggest platform for me to start from here. I don't have to start maybe where my parents started, and I don't have to start maybe without, you know, on the street or in a bad situation, but I've been given an opportunity to flourish, and I've been placed in what is called good ground, called the church. There's no excuse for people, kids to backslide and go, go out in the world. There's no excuse for it. So the Bible then teaches us that the, the salvation of our souls is, is very important. And so the first chapter continues. And then there's many people that wonder about the coming of the Lord and why we even bother to look. A lot of individuals don't, are teaching the congregation, don't even worry about it. He's going to come when he's going to come. That's not what the scriptures teach us, though. To them that look for his appearance, shall he appear the second time without sin to salvation. And there are many, many more scriptures that teach us that. And yes, it becomes wearisome because he has not returned. And it becomes weary, but he said, be not weary in well-doing. We continue doing this because we might die before he returns. And so we must always anticipate that we are not promised tomorrow. 
And so this is what the Lord tells us, that we, might, that we should uh, be about our Father's business, that we might be heavenly minded, not earthly minded. To be heavenly minded is life and peace. To be earthly minded is death and destruction. So your mind has to be stayed on Jesus. Don't get mad at me as your pastor telling you that. That's what the Lord says. I'm just the messenger. That's what we have to do. And this is, it takes self-sacrifice. It takes self-sacrifice. That's what it takes. It takes a dying to self and living unto him. Now, it tells us this. That the prophets, which were in the Old Testament, the Bible says in verse uh, number 10, it says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. So they were searching for something about the future. This is, I'm talking about Daniel, Ezekiel, Hosea, Jeremiah. These were men dedicated to God that understood that the Messiah was going to come. So they, uh, they searched diligently. And the Bible says, who prophesied of the grace which shall come unto you. So they prophesied about these things. Isaiah prophesied, precept upon precept, line upon line, stammer and lips, so another time will he speak to his people. So he, he, this is what it's talking about. That, and the prophet of the grace that should come to us. And then it says, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Or what it what it. Uh, signify in a sense would be signify which means pointed to what it all pointed to searching what or what manner of time notice this the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify so that means that all the prophets had the spirit of Christ in them even though Christ had not come yet so the spirit of Christ is the spirit of the father it's, it's, there's only one spirit but he hears so that we get an knowledge of who he's going to talk who he's talking about it calls it the Spirit of Christ, which was in them. What did it point to? That's what it's saying. When it pointed to, when it testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So not only about the crucifixion of Jesus, but the glory that should happen afterwards through the church and his appearings and so forth. So that's why it's so important. And that's why it was written in that fashion. Then it says in Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us. It's, this is written for us. This is, why, this is why they searched way back then, and it never was revealed unto them, but it was revealed unto us, but unto us they did minister these things. What they were said was written for our admonition, so that those upon the last days would, would search and get closer to the understanding of what Jesus uh, the plan that Jesus has for mankind, but especially for the church, especially for you and I. So it, it has to be like a clear and a certain sound so that you and I can act accordingly. So this is what the gospel is about. It must be presented in a clear fashion so that we know how to respond to it. They were pricked in their heart and they said, what must we do? And then they told them, Clear instructions, repent and be baptized, every one of you. So the instructions are very clear. It's men that interpret the Bible different, that muddle the waters, and muddy the waters. Then it tells us in verse number, in, in, it continues, uh, reporting to you, by them which have preached the gospel, which would be like, and this is, it would be like me, by uh, those that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Holy Ghost filled men. Which things the angel desired to look into. So we have more understanding many times because we have an experience of the Holy Ghost in us and the angels would desire to get an idea of what this is that we feel, this fellowship that God has with us and not angels. And they would like to have some comprehension of it, but they don't. This is why like on the Ark of the Covenant, they had a, there was a box and the things were inside of it. There's two angels on it that are sort of looking down into it. it. They cover and protect, but they're not able to comprehend how the blood which is spilled on it uh, was able to move sin away. And how the blood of Jesus, when we're baptized in Jesus' name, is able to remove our sin. 
And so these angels are ministering spirits to the people of God, and they keep us sometimes out of trouble. And they keep us out of danger at times, or help us in times of distress. So then it tells us, in verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, it says, Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. A very powerful, important scripture here. It says to gird up the loins of our mind. Now, when a person girded up their loins, they would take their long, their, their, their long gowns that they would wear in, in those days, and they would take the back end and pull it up, and they would make like... They would make like, uh, bring them up above the knees, the men, so that they could run. And they, that's what it meant, gird up the loins so they would not be in the way. They would tuck it in the sash in the front, and it was like they're wearing shorts. And so they would be able to work and, and move about, and they would be able to uh, be more efficient in that fashion. And it means they're girt to work, or they're girt to, they will, gee, girt himself so he could wash the disciples' feet. So that means you're going to do something that is, that requires some action and you can't be hindered in any way. So this is what the Bible says, gird up the loins, but it's talking about the mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. That which gives you productive thought up here. It says, gird it up, get ready to work with your mind and to know that your mind is essential for salvation. Now, <clears throat> it tells us this. Be sober and hope. Notice what he says. What to hope for? Hope for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But I thought I was living in grace. You are living in grace. The spirit of grace is given to you. The Holy Ghost is a spirit of grace. It's given to you. Uh, every man according to a measure. We all have a certain measure of faith. So the Bible says that that's, we re realize this. That's not enough to transfigure us. We're just given what is called the down payment. We haven't been paid in full. You know what a down payment is, right? It is the measure of faith is like a down payment. It's called in the Bible the earnest of the inheritance. Is the Lord gives you, gives 10%, we'll call it that, 10%, signifying the whole. He puts 10% of the Holy Ghost in you. And that's what's going to hold you till he comes again, till he comes to claim you. This is why it's important. This is why we, David prayed, and Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't take the down payment away. I want to be, I want to make it. Or, or for us it would be, don't do spite to the Spirit of God which God has given to us. Don't sin on purpose. We sin in weakness. We sin in error. We sin by omission. We sin by commission. We miss the mark in many different ways. But when you purposely try to do that through neglect, don't neglect your great salvation. You, you gird up the loins of your mind. You think about a, a way to improve yourself in serving God because as I, 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 as the way I think, I must be saved. I can't think it for you, but I must be saved. And I'm saved by preaching. I save myself and those that hear me. That's my office. So when it's telling us about the grace of God, that he's given us a down payment. Then it says, and the grace, where was it? Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus. So when Jesus comes in the clouds, he is going to come with more grace to finish the other 90% of Holy Ghost that you need to transfigure your body for the rapture. But you have to have what he gave you. All right? To him that had not shall be taken away even that which he seemeth to have. But if we hold fast to the best that we can to not, to not sin against the spirit of grace that God has given to you, you if you hold on to the Holy Ghost, the Lord, amen, is going to come for you. And he'll attach it to that spirit, identifying that you have a down payment in you in the Holy Ghost, and that Holy Ghost and the calling and the spirit that he brings. It says the spirit of grace that shall be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When he appears in the heavens, then he, that grace is going to come into you. You're going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
Can you say praise the Lord? Can you say, I want to go? Amen. You want to say, I want to be raptured. I want to be changed. So Peter is giving us things here that aren't talked about really anywhere else. So this is bound, what he is bound here on earth is bound in heaven. That's the way it's going to take place. It's not a wayward thought. It's not a, it's not a misrepresentation of, of God. It is exactly what is going to take place. This is why we have to hold fast to the truth. If you hold fast to the truth, you're holding fast to that spirit that's in you because it is the spirit of truth that you have. <clears throat> now, let's see here. And then quickly it says this. Uh, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition uh, from your father. So what... It's not a traditional thing that we're doing. Everyone is called out from our traditions, all right? So we're not redeemed by the way you used to think before, but we are redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have received through him. And with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which, abide, which liveth and abideth forever. Can we say amen? Chapter 2. It gives us, that's the, there's a lot more there, but that is what I want, I feel, to bring the core to you to give a comprehensive thought down for this Bible study. So chapter 2 as this. Uh, Peter, 1 Peter 2 and 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So when you're a new saint, it, it's pretty natural that when a baby is born, they want milk. So... He uses this analogy, that as, as newborn babes, new Christians, desire the sincere milk of the word. Don't let, don't let uh, anything destroy that, your first love or your desire to read more of the Bible. You must draw close to God or you will be very malnourished or you will be very, you're, you're going you're gonna to not make it. So it says, desire it. If you don't desire it, make yourself desire it. Put some stuff away, put a few meals away. Put, uh, make yourself uh, get away from your crowd maybe. Loneliness is a good thing. You draw you closer to God and you draw nigh to him and he will draw nigh to you. It is, it, is with, it is with travail and suffering that we enter into the kingdom. But it's not the way the devil says, oh, it's too hard. It's not too hard. You fall in love. Whom having not seen, you learn to love him. You start to think about all the things, all the close calls, all the, all the turn of events, all doors that have opened in your life, you know, the, the people that love you, the people you love, and, and you learn that this is all, all possible because Jesus called us, and he's making us successful as long as we don't throw up, as long as we don't become rebellious, we will become successful. Now, <clears throat> It says, it says uh, as newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Next verse says, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Another verse says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So by that, you're using your senses of observation by tasting in, in a metaphor and you're understanding that the things you've been through, like I, I just mentioned a few moments ago, the things that you've experienced, your experience Put in the positive light that the Lord meant it for good. I don't care what you've been through, where you come from. Come to this conclusion. Bad stuff happened how half my life, but the Lord meant it for good. Yeah. Ultimately, ultimately, the Lord meant it for good. That's where you've got to get to, to that point. Instead of whoa, whoa, whoa. And it's a discipline that's learned. It's a discipline because mankind, man by himself is not satisfied with the way that he is. Oh, you are? Okay. Well, I wish I could have been taller, stronger. Back then, I play better. But I realize now, hey, you know what? The reason the Lord made me this way, he had a plan for me. He didn't want me to do the things that I wanted to do. And the limits, I already had limited ability, limited ability without even knowing. 
but your mind thinks, I can do this, you know, I can, I can, I can hopefully make, you know, play ball or this or that, but the reality is after you see, all, all of a sudden that you look back and say, you know what, the Lord meant it this way. Amen. Then he reminds us in this, in, in 1 Peter, we skip to verse number 9. It, he says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show for, forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter's telling us that, that we're this generation that's chosen, we're a priesthood, a holy nation. What for? To show forth praises. That is your job. Notice this. This is, this is your, the nature of your job, to show forth praises. So if you're like a complainer, you're a person that's always, you know, just uh, negative, you, it's not praising God. It says, you are, you remind, I am a chosen, I belong to a chosen generation. Hey, I'm going to be a king, a royal priesthood. I belong to a holy nation. A peculiar people means very special, like a diamond that's put away hidden. A peculiar treasure, something that's very precious to him. And why has he made us in that fashion? That we might show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness. Maybe you don't know what kind of darkness you were in. You know, many times people don't really pay attention. And... Uh, but when we realized that the darkness that we were in before we were saved was we had the wrath of God abiding on our lives. That as good as a person that you might be, you were not going to go to heaven. Say what? That's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> you weren't going to make it. So... You guess, now you can say, man, that was a close call, man. I didn't even be aware of that, you know? It's like somebody tell you, you know what? You, you could have got killed by something you were doing, but, but you should be glad you didn't touch that one particular button over there because something could have happened to you. And you say, oh, man, I didn't realize I was in such danger. Well, it's, it's, it's salvation or damnation. That's what it is. And so this is what... This is why God has called us, and he reminds us, you're a, a chosen generation, a royal priest, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should, our job, show forth praises. We're priests. And so we learn to praise God, and you, and you, and you get away from all the negative stuff that the flesh is natural, that is naturally in our flesh, and we learn to persevere, to be successful in praising God. The Bible calls it even the fruit of our lips. In the Old Testament, it calls it really strange. You know, it said that even the calves of our lips, like even the cows of our lips, you know, like, like it means like these to sacrifice calves. So they're using a metaphor. Those are sacrifices. The sacrifices of our lips, but they use in the Old Testament, calves of our lips. Now, this is, why we, this is why it's important to praise God. Even in your prayer time, sometimes you, you stop praying and you praise the Lord. Amen. You are the witness. Now, <clears throat> in, toward the end of this chapter, it says, Why are we giving up? It said, We had called us out of darkness into marvelous light, which in times past we were not a people. You didn't exist. Even though you lived, you didn't exist. Even though you lived and saw, and saw, tasted, you were not alive. This is why Jesus said at one time at a funeral, let the dead, they say, let's go down. No, he said, let the dead bury the dead. But they're alive. But, no, but the Lord already saw the way they were, far from God. Death lived in them. Which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. Therefore, we praise the Lord. But this is what worship service is all about. We praise the Lord. We think on these things, and we submit ourselves to God. Then out, uh, in, at, toward the end of the chapter, it starts to change the, uh, the manner of, of generalities, and then it starts teaching about... Uh, 
an attitude that we should have. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Remember it said earlier that it said uh, to the strangers that are scattered throughout. He used the term again. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers, 1 Peter 2, 11, and pilgrims, abstain from, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. So, so we are given, listen, when we serve God, we're, we, are, we have been set free. Therefore, now we must make proper choices. We're not sinners anymore. Even though you haven't practiced righteousness yet, yet you, the Lord sees you as holy and he sees you as righteous, as a chosen, somebody has been chosen, as a priest, as a king, future king. That's the way he sees you because the blood of Jesus, you have his lineage, you have been birthed again. You've been begotten. And so when this happens, now he reminds us, Peter tells us, now listen, he says, I told you a lot of good stuff, but he says, you're strangers and pilgrims. You don't, this world is not your home. You live in the midst of a perverse generation. But he says, abstain from the fleshly lust which war against your soul. So <clears throat> when, when, you, when, you, when, you, the, when the pull of the flesh or whatever it is that it brings temptation into your life, whether it be of the eyes, whether it might be of the, of the, of, uh, of the pride of life, or the flesh, whatever it might be that is pulling on you, that's what draws you away. That's, you're, you're, you're tempted by that, by being drawn away of stuff that is in here. That stuff out there doesn't draw you like that. It's what's in here. I like to joke with my wife. Sometimes we're walking by a store and there's a bunch of donuts. I'll go over to the glass like... <laughs> <and I'm> like <laughs> because it's drawing me. And I was like, that's the way I feel on the inside. Like the, I'm holding on to the to the parking meter outside because I wants to go and get ice cream, you know. And so it, it, we're drawn away of our own desire. It, the devil has no power. He can put things in front of you. He can put thoughts. He can run with thoughts by you. Those you cast down, if you know they're not in line with God, but these are the things that we're drawn from in here. We have nobody to blame but ourselves because God gives us a new conscience and a new heart when the Holy Ghost. It, 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 the Holy Ghost even tells us when not to get mad when you're being deceived. Listen, you don't have no reason to get mad about, overly mad about stuff. But you're tempted to get mad. That's another thing. But you resist and you temper yourself so that you become uh, a light unto the Lord. It says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. So that tells us that obey the laws of the land as long as they don't transgress against the things of God. In other words, like, Dave, like Daniel, he was always subject to the king. But when they said, no more prayer early in the morning, no more prayer three times, only prayer to the God, my God, then he was not subject to that ordinance. Because there's a higher king than that king. So there, there's what you call an understanding. But as far as natural things, you know, it's like, it's like uh, you obey things for civil obedience, all right? From, uh, I have nothing to add to that. You can add your own. <laughs> Amen. So chapter 3 speaks on this. Now, this is, an, this is an amazing thing because uh, this, has been, this has been really taken out of context many times. Now, this is going to be talking about uh, 1 Peter 3 and 1. Likewise, ye wives, notice this, be subject, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they may also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So, women have a tremendous amount of power as to how the, how faith is going to grow in a household. If, there's a, if, if they have married to a man that don't want to come to church, a um, bad man, a churlish man at the Bible said one instance, uh, it says that the, that the wife uh, should be subject, first of all, to that churlish man, all right? Not to anybody else, just that particular person. And then it makes a statement that if, if he doesn't obey the word, that they might also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. So the influence of a wife as the help, notice that she's a helpmeet 
of the man. If the man is, like I said, not capable of being very spiritual, yet the Bible said this is special instruction. Now, it, says, it makes a statement in verse 2. While they likewise behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So that means because of their conduct, uh, uh, a woman helps her husband by, number one, being in subjection, being holy, uh, having uh, her conversation or her way of life doesn't say, you know, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you go to church, but look how you treat me here at home. And I see, you know, might come up with something like that. When a man, I, I went to go visit him and say, hey, listen, brother, you haven't been to church for about two, you know, I haven't seen you in about a month. I was an assistant pastor, they sent me. And I said, you haven't seen me. <laughs> and I dreaded to go at this particular time. I said, yes, you haven't been in church in X amount of time. And he said, yes, I know, I know, brother. He said, I know, brother. He said, just, how can I go to church when I live with the devil? I said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I was, br- <laughs> tell her, get thee behind me. I don't know. <laughs> but the funny thing is, at church, she acted like she was, she, she was, I assume that she was like that at home. <laughs> and then he started complaining. I after a while said, well, this is a job for the pastor, not me. <laughs> so I, was, <laughs> I just said, yeah, it was good to see you, brothers. And you know, I got to go, but I hope to see you in church sometime. So, <clears throat> so in that instance, and sure enough, toward the end, it, it all fell apart, but she should have been living in a way where, where she would have convinced him to go to church, and through her conduct, he would have had no hesitancy to come to church. So this is important to understand that, that they were both baptized. So it's important to realize that we are, uh, this is where the wife is, is the center of the house, of the family. She's, uh, we just have past Mother's Day. And we know the influence. I, I was thinking about my mother and all the influences the other day. And I'm thinking, it's amazing how that's what holds a house together and a family together. And that's the center of when, we, when you all show up for a reunion or whatever. It's basically because mom is there. Other than that, usually once the mother is not there, things change. Because that is the center. Now... It makes a statement, and, and many times, like in, in the, I had been taught in the, like in the, I was in the uh, Apostolic Assembly in the, in the, the uh, UPC, United Pentecostal Church, uh, and so they would use the next verse of scripture where a woman couldn't wear anything that was flashy, okay? You would have to be, you would be pretty much, when we first came in, almost accepted only when you uh, if you look like you just stepped off the pilgrim, the Mayflower, you know, and you look like a wallflower, you know, it just, it was, that's the way it was. And so, there's a verse of scripture here that says, notice this, who's adorning, let it not be with outward adorning or plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. It says, but let it be the hidden heart, let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even an ornament of meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. Now, I want you to understand the context. Notice how important this is. It says, for after this manner, next verse, for after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. So the whole portion is talking about about a woman of the house that is her attitude toward her husband and how it ought to be such that that don't, you know, your husband, after you've been married, you know who you are. So it says, but it says, let it not be like you're all, it's, the, the main thing you present to your husband is you dress up, you put your, or you, you do your curls and you put your ornament on and your nice apparel and so it says, that's not the way you convert your husband. It has to be, well, I dress up to you for you, and I do all this, and I, 
But that's not the point. He says, let it be the hidden person in your heart that's going to change that man. You're pleasing. It's not talking about, it's not talking about the way we think, well, in order to be in my church, you can't wear an ounce of gold, not even a wedding ring or this. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a women that have the proper concept in their minds of how to be, how to be that person for that man that God joined them to. Because women uh, love naturally, but men have to be sort of taught to love. All right? They're just different. This is why the Bible says, husbands, this is a commandment. Husbands, love your wives. All right? Then it say, wives, love your husbands. No, it says, to them, it says, be in subjection. So if they're going to be in subjection, it says, you she subject, love your wife. So this is why the scripture is, because immediately it points to, you know, Sarah herself. He said, it talks about Sarah, the, the, the relationship between her husband, Abraham. And it says this. Where was I? Yes, 1 Peter 5, uh, 3 and 5. It says, For after this manner in the old time, in, in the Old Testament, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. It's talking about here, it's talking about their, their, their uh, uh, hidden man of the heart, which is uh, a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is a great price. So it says, For after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. My, my wife never called me Lord, okay, but. <laughs> I'm still working on that. <laughs> and it's never going to work. So it says, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord or Master. Whose daughters ye are as long as you do well. She's called me better than that, believe me. But this is what's important. This is really what's important. Is that, is that Sarah recognizes that she must be in subjection unto him. Realize this. We're living in a, in a crazy world, all right, where everything's mixed up. Everything's turned upside down. Oh, my goodness. I'm having so much fun. It's already past time. So give me a few more minutes here because this is a very, very powerful thought here. So as, as, as Abraham and, and Sarah are, give the example, you know, they're not perfect. So they, they, they have a, a skirmishes here and there, but the whole issue is she's always subject and subject to him. And so the Bible gives her the great accolade that she is a great woman of God. And it says, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with, uh, with any amazement. In other words, you're not terrified by things in your life because your husband, you're trusting in him that he's going to take care of situations, and you're not afraid to step forward to give the reins to your husband. Ultimately, that's what it, it takes to have a, a marriage commitment is that the husband trusts everything he can, his reputation, every to his, to his wife. Therefore, this is why, especially the young marriage here, don't ever answer questions about, they might ask about your husband. Don't ever volunteer things about your husband. He is, you protect him, and you protect everything that you do together. That is only your business. Amen. When somebody comes and tells you, I've got all these troubles, do you? Yeah. They come with that kind of nonsense. <laughs> They're just fishing, okay? Uh, they might be weak, and they might be that they might weak. That's the way they understand life is. But when you're really serving God, you realize that, that as the woman subjects herself to a man, you might say, well, I, I, I can't go to Morningstar because, no, you can. Because it will turn your life around. It will, it will bring joy into your life. It will turn things around so where you realize that the Bible says that 
the man wasn't made for the woman. The woman was made for the man. So this is where, you know, it, like, like this goes on, on the internet. I'm going to have women's lib all around my building here. <laughs> Just you don't be in it, okay? So, but that's God talking about who we are and what we should be before he comes for us. Because the relationship of the church with Jesus is the same way, husband and wife. We are subject to him. We're modeled after a woman. And he is modeled after the man. We call him Lord. And we are without any terror or amazement because he protects us. Can you see that? So that's what causes you to be less friction in a life or in a marriage. Then it makes a statement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. In other words, uh, wise up, man. That's what he's saying. According to knowledge. Understand that you are different. Understand that, that she's not a slave. Understand that she's not. Understand that she is your help me. She is, the Bible says, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. They're weak in a sense of strength, okay? But they're not weak in the strength of will, all right? Can you say amen to that? Oh, come on. You, you believe it? That's the truth. <laughs> they're the weaker vessel. How many women are playing pro football? How many women are playing pro baseball? How many women are playing, I'm talking about with the men, playing pro basketball? Why is that? I thought we were all, you can't put a woman in there because she's a weaker vessel in that sense. She's made to be protected. I mean, you can't, they want equal pay. Can you imagine if one woman got pro football, how much she had to get paid for to sit the bench? This world is crazy. But the scripture tells us this, that they are the weaker. They hold a greater, greater, greater uh, understanding because they keep the family together. They keep this world come, going in the right fashion, in the right direction. Godly women are the salt of the earth when it comes to the center of the church. The church is even called like a woman. So this is important. This is something that everyone must consider. Notice it finally. I'm... I'm it says, likewise, husband, dwell with them according to uh, knowledge. Try to figure your wife out. You know, sometimes you guys feel, I still can't figure her out. Well, <laughs> according to knowledge. <laughs> what? <laughs> Giving honor unto the wife. Notice what it says. When you come to the knowledge, then you give honor more. You realize, hey, I got to give more honor to my wife. Not only as a weaker vessel, but as being heirs together of the grace of God is because she's being heirs together. She's my helpmate. I can't make it the way I should make it without her. We are heirs together. We're going to have the same salvation. It says, and if we have this attitude, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, you're going to know if your prayers are hindered if you can, like I say, if you don't pray together, you get, get a chance to know that one another, you're praying, all right? Hold yourself accountable. And then finally, finally be all of one mind, speaking about the husband and the wife, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. He's, notice what it says here. Love as brethren, all right? Have that kind family love. Be pitiful and be courteous one to another. And if you agree with that, say amen. Yeah. Amen. Stand with me. Amen. So, you know, when we go, what caught my attention in this portion of the lesson, when we go to these different, well, we came out of, like I said, those churches that you can't wear anything because or you can't wear uh, broidered hair, this or that. It's it's pointing to this, that that should not be your goal. Because it says, 
it is be subject to your husband. You don't want to do the excess where you are like you're presenting yourself to all the men out there. You know, that you want to just shine for everybody. No. This is why we have a, a, a quiet and a meek spirit. This is why we make sure that our spirit on the inside is correct and right. And that should bring praise rather than anything possibly that you really uh, shine from on the outside. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you for your, your patience today because once we got on that subject, we had to finish. So we're thankful. Next week we'll be talking about uh, the second book of Peter, I believe. Amen. Pastor Jason.